It's Paul Marsh here on Express, and I'm absolutely delighted to say that I am joined by the vaccine's Justin Young. Justin, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm really, really good. It's a, it's a delight to talk to you. The last time we spoke would have been ten, maybe twelve years ago. So, but we'll, we'll get we'll get to that a little bit later, actually. Okay, and um, because of course on Friday it's a very, very big day because not only do you release your album, a pickup full of carnations, but you're also down here in Portsmouth promoting it. We are indeed. I think there's something uh, maybe mildly sacrilegious about uh, someone who was born. Uh, and went to school in Southampton celebrating their album release in Portsmouth. We're, but, trying, um, we're trying to endear yeah, you to our yeah. listeners right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, we chose Portsmouth nonetheless, so that there says something, doesn't that, it? Yeah. It's, it's exactly yeah. it. It's exactly yeah. it. So on, on Friday on the 12th, when Pick Up Full of Carnations is released, you're down here playing a special Pine Vinyl album release gig at the port in the Portsmouth Gaiety Bar. Now, um, for people lucky enough to get tickets, because this sold out like quicker than you can imagine – for the people lucky enough to have tickets, what can they expect? Well, I mean, as with any vaccines show, there'll be a sort of uh, healthy dose of kind of, I guess, fan favourites. But then, you know, also we'll be playing, you know, it'll be, I think, maybe the second, second, yeah, second kind of show, like post or first show post album release. But we're playing a show the night before in Kingston. So it'll be kind of the second time we've ever played any of the new stuff live so we'll be it'll be we're quite excited about playing some new stuff um but yeah i mean i think it's going to be sweaty in there <laughs> is it going to be like a full band experience or a little bit stripped down how's it no, looking? absolutely full. no absolutely full band no it's going to be a full gig yeah 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 um now you played victorious festival in portsmouth last year and you played the guild hall the year before crowds are generally very good in portsmouth is is this the reason that you keep coming back they are very good in Portsmouth. And actually, I, I think I preferred this last Victorious to the first Victorious we played. It felt like, uh, it felt, uh, I don't know, it felt powerful. I was, I was, I was, I think it was one of our favorite gigs of the summer, actually. Um, why do we keep coming back? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> if, if book them. But it is, but it is interesting that we have, we have sort of played four times in the last five years. And I don't think we played once in the first kind of five, six years of our career. So. Is, oh, it's, it probably says more about where Portsmouth's going than where the vaccines are going. Well, do you know what? So literally um, yesterday I had a couple of comedians in and, and we were talking about Portsmouth in general and everything else like that. And I interviewed Simon Brodkin, who's another comedian last year. And he, I mentioned that his gig had virtually sold out and he said, oh, there can't be a lot else going on in Portsmouth. And we said, well, actually, Portsmouth has got so much going on. And I think the reason why it has so much going on is because the people of Portsmouth always come out you know the, the the gigs are everywhere is always sold out it's always busy there's always loads going on so i think it's the people of portsmouth that kind of bring that to the events well thank i'm very grateful to the people of portsmouth um why is it about the small intimate gigs that you like so like i say well, i interviewed you around about 10 years ago uh you played the joiners in southampton to stop it going out of business which it did and it's still going strong so what is it about those small intimate gigs that you really like i mean small venues are sort of you know they're sort of the patchwork of 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 well, not just small towns and cities but big towns and cities and i think you know they're a place for people to their communities as much as anything, aren't they? They're a place for a place for people to kind of congregate and connect. And, you know, for artists, they're an amazing place to get in, you know, they're an amazing opportunity uh, and platform to be able to get into cities that they wouldn't otherwise be able to visit. And then for local people, you know, I saw some very pivotal gigs myself at, at Southampton joiners and all that kind of stuff and played a lot. And, and uh, you know, I think without those grassroots venues, uh the country would be you know much lesser of mm. a place kind of culturally i would say i mean you so you you look at those smaller venues like the joiners and and the gaiety and and places like that and then you look at things like victorious where you're playing to what i don't know 80,000 people or something ridiculous like that how does that compare when you're on stage the difference between looking out over a sea of people and not seeing a single face and then playing that intimate show where you can literally see people mouthing words back to you I guess it's like salt and sugar you know they're both very like power they're both like very powerful but I think in like different ways like there's something incredibly overwhelming about 
playing to yeah tens of thousands of people in a festival field but when you've got somebody you know a foot from your or a whole row of people a foot from your face and you're kind of you know you're sharing sweat and they're probably getting some of my saliva in their face too at some point during the set you know that's like a kind of that's like a very that's a that's a very I think intense connection as well like a deeper connection in some ways because you're kind of really sharing sharing in this energy I think mm. whenever um whenever I've, I've DJed or compared or whatever I've done I always found it far easier to to talk to a massive crowd rather than a small crowd where I can literally see people not laughing at my jokes <laughs> well exactly and I think you can sort of disassociate and disconnect when there's a larger crowd but it feels a lot more personal when there's a small crowd yeah uh, getting back to the album and the tracks that we've heard so far, because obviously I've only heard the same ones that everybody else has. Uh, Heartbreak Kid, which is a former Express track of the week, and Love to Walk Away, which is currently on our playlist. They both Thank feel you. like they fit the, the vaccine's vibe of, of short, punchy, fun tracks. But at the same time, they also feel quite grown up compared to some of your earlier tracks. How do you feel that your sound has evolved? Yeah, I mean, we've grown up, I would like to think, mm. in, in in some ways at least. And so you'd, you'd like to think that the music you're making is a reflection of where you are in life and all that kind of stuff. And I think that this album, we were aware that it sounded familiar, but we wanted it to sound fresh as well. And, you know, you're always trying to refine what you do as an artist. You're trying to kind of, you know, retain this kind of DNA that is at your core, but kind of evolve and, and st you know, step into the future. Um and not retread old ground and all that kind of stuff. So it's this process of refinement, I would say. And, and you know, maybe aging is a process of refinement too. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, I am I think that, they're, that they do have that kind of vaccines, frenetic, visceral sort of feeling. They have maybe vaccines they have, DNA is what they have. Yeah. But then maybe they are a bit more kind of, I don't know. Refined, I think, is a great word. Yeah, well, yeah, go on. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of refined, I, I think both of, well, certainly yourself, maybe not so much me, but um, I watched the video of our interview back at the Joiners. When was it? Around 2010 or 11, something like no, that? No, probably would have been later than that. Probably would have been 2012 or 13, I think. So yeah. around about 10 or 11 years ago, you yeah. were a very, very hairy man. Yes, I was. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the kind of... Uh, that was a kind of a pretty short-lived phase, but a phase nonetheless. <laughs> I think the only thing that's changed about me is a little bit more grey hair maybe around the sides. <laughs> I can't grow the beard now because I look like Santa. Well, uh, my, mine's starting to go grey too now. I saw the first grey hair in it the other day. Oh, no, I remember those days. It's frightening, isn't it, when you see that first one? It is, yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> 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 now um googling you guys for research has, has become a harder task since 2020 <laughs> if only you'd known right i know you know i think we chose the name as we thought it was such a such a kind of empty vessel this kind of meaningless kind of empty vessel and then you sort of had about three or four years into our career you started to get these kind of um facebook mums who were kind of who, who were buying into this pseudoscience about autism and all that kind of stuff so we started to get like a few like nutters around then <laughs> and then yeah with the pandemic it just hit a whole new level of ridiculousness and it's it continues to be a bit of a challenge you know every time we post something it's getting pinned in case there's some sort of like or flagged rather in case there's some sort of like misinformation or something um it's a new yeah. song it's not misinformation it's genuine yeah Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the only other band that I can remember something similar happening to is there was a band called A who had a hit called Nothing. I'm not sure if you remember. I remember them, yeah. yeah. Of course, they yeah. called themselves A because they wanted to be the first band that you saw when you went into a record shop. And then I think literally about three years later, record shops went out of existence. Brutal, brutal. <laughs> Can't game the system, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, obviously we got this big show, uh, oh, sorry, not the big show, we got a small intimate show coming up in Portsmouth on February the 12th, and then you head out on a UK tour, including playing Southampton on the 14th of February. Is Valentine's Day, Is that was that coincidence, or is that, you well, know? Well, it was know? a coincidence, but, you know, I can't really think of many places more romantic uh, than Southampton Guildhall watching the <laughs> vaccines. So, you know, what better way to spend your Valentine's Day? Holding a nice sweaty hand. 
exactly yeah <laughs> uh, now do you still have the same nervousness about shows as you did 15 years ago or do you just kind of know that you can go out there and absolutely smash it yeah i get more excited than nervous really because i sort of i think there is a degree of confidence that comes with doing so long and also like some you know self-confidence in what we're doing and i i don't know i yeah i i mean southampton i suppose is funny isn't it because i have like a few old friends and family that come and it, maybe it's harder for them to like suspend disbelief um so maybe i get in my head a bit more about that same when we're playing in london where most people we know are um but no i don't really get nervous i get very excited and you know like also playing southampton guildhall like 13 years into our career like still being able to sell it out is this big tangible thing for me because you know i grew up going to see uh people play there who i thought were these like huge rock stars it was like a big big venue to me and so um it kind of blows my mind that we're still able to to play it and stuff. It feels like special every time we go. How many people come out of the woodwork and ask for guest list? Do you know what? I don't know that many people. I don't. Most people I know have moved on. But um, but but it's is it's London always, the one for guest list? Yeah, yeah. But they're always, you know, they're all they're always very welcome. There's half a dozen people who who have stayed in the area who I went to school with and stuff like that. And you know, they're always very welcome. It's always nice to see them. We always have drinks afterwards and stuff. That's nice. That's nice. It's, it's always one of those things, isn't it, where you're going somewhere. We So obviously here at Express, we cover Victorious Festival. And it's amazing the people that come out of the woodwork just a few weeks beforehand. Do you think you can source out Victorious tickets, mate? I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and so are you now at that point where you, when you perform live, where you're choosing a set list between the new tracks that you love playing and the, uh, the classics that the crowd wants to hear? I mean, it's hard because we're six albums in now and you're, yeah. you're always going to leave off songs that uh, people are probably are paying to come and listen to. Um, you know, I do think that a rock show is entertainment. And so, you know, we always play as many kind of fan favorites as we can. And, you know, they're not boring for, for us either because every time a new crowd breathes new new life into them, it feels like playing them for the first time. And it's very, pow- you know, it's a very p- powerful transaction of energy like you know when everybody's singing those lyrics back to you so they're often you know the most fun to play but then of course like you know you want to balance it out with new material and actually i do think the, the songs from the new record are going to lend themselves really well to live and i don't think they're going to be too challenging for people i don't think they're going to you know signal a ma- mass exodus to the bar or anything like that no well, well like i said earlier you know the, the the few tracks that you've released already you know they they've ha- they have that vaccine's dna so i think even if they are reasonably new and people don't quite know the words as well as they do the others there's no reason they're not going to bounce along um Please. so speaking of some of your earlier tracks i was i interviewed a, a young 16 year old singer yesterday who's literally just released her first track and the one piece of advice that i gave her was never were well, not so much right, but never record a song that you're not prepared to play for the rest of your life. Okay, because you never know what song is going to blow up. You never know what song is going to hit the top of the charts and everyone's going to sing for the rest of their life. And then what one you think might do that and never does anything. So are there any of those tracks from the first album that you look at and you go, oh, not that one again? You know, funny enough, the first that you know, the first album we'd we'd kind of written and recorded de- demos that sounded very close to what the record ended up sounding like before we kind of found managers before we got signed everything we we kind of we'd been sort of like hiding away just as a group of friends for quite a few months um just working on music before anyone heard it um and so i'm really proud of the first record i think with the success of the first record we were pressured into writing and recording our second album i think much sooner than we would have liked to in hindsight and there are a couple of songs on there that I'm really proud of and there are a couple of songs on there that you know I don't think would have made it onto a stronger record but it's just it's just the it's just the way it panned out really I guess well that always happens with a second album doesn't it yeah. like you say you've yeah. had potentially five six years honing your craft and perfecting it and like you say tossing away those ones that you don't ever want people to hear again yeah and then when when it goes bang and it goes out into the world and everybody loves it you know the people that make the money out of these things go right we want you to create another album that sounds exactly like your first one exactly exactly (laughs) um how does it feel when you have to drop one of those tracks that you love maybe a newer one from the set list again you know i sort of uh, I don't, I, you know, 
I, I think actually I, I wrote the set the kind of rough set list for the first few shows the day before yesterday and there was like a couple of songs that I wished we were playing but kind of made up for the fact by the fact that you know pretty much everything else I'm excited to play so there's you know there's always stuff that you don't get to play but that's so uh, we're very lucky to be six albums in so it's a good problem to have I always really like it when we, I mean, we talk about these intimate shows. I've seen some intimate shows recently with artists who, you know, were maybe big in the nineties or the noughties or whatever. And they sort of come down a little bit now. And I like it when I get to see these shows where they'll play that album track or that B side or that unreleased track and they'll do it ac acoustically or whatever it is. So, you know, maybe a few years down the line, you might get to do a secret gig somewhere or something. Well, you know, I know that there are, I also know that there are artists, you know, who'll play albums in full and all that kind of stuff. And we're probably not there yet, but that sort of stuff always sounds quite fun. Yeah, like on an anniversary or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the thing is, I mean, we were talking about Victorious earlier and then you're talking about going on tour. I think in my own personal opinion, when I when I pay to go and see a band on tour, I expect them to play, I don't know, 70% of their new album, something like that, with the with the hits thrown in as well. But when I go and see them at a festival like Victorious or something like that, that's when I expect to hear 70% hits and 30% of the new stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense, actually. Yeah, I think we're still only ever 30% new. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, you finish your UK tour and you're going to go straight over to America and Canada and you're going to tour with the Kooks. How excited are yeah. you about that? Yeah, that'd be really fun. Like we've, you know, I've known Luke sort of socially for, for quite a few years, but we've never really played with them. Um, uh, and I think I think it's a bill that's going to work well in the US. I think that we're probably both filed under kind of English indie rock or whatever. So I think it's going to be a good I think it's going to be a, a good pairing and I'm excited you know excited to tour the states again it's always again that's kind of stuff of you know boyhood dreams really yeah is that is that something i was about to say being on tour like that because i know it's it's very different isn't it being on tour people think that when you go to america for a month or whatever it is that you get to see everything and you get to have fun but sometimes it is literally coach venue hotel coach venue hotel. yeah i mean you know I, I i i feel guilty to you know admitting it but but there are days where you don't need the dressing room you know and there are cities you you go to that you don't really you could be anywhere and you don't explore <clears throat> and there are other days you feel uh, you know and now and now i think i try and at least go for a walk or go for a drink after the, the gig and just try and try and make sure you, you soak in some of the city but no a lot of a lot of you know being on tour is spent in transit not necessarily enjoying yeah. where you are yeah. yeah the one thing i found when i went to america uh this is a few years ago now is obviously the jet lag waking up at like four or five o'clock in the morning allowed me to go out and explore the city when there was literally nobody there so you go out and do all the tourist stuff take all the pictures before seven o'clock in the morning when everybody gets up it's one of the best things about going to the to the states actually is is waking up early and not feeling tired i like that <laughs> uh, so when obviously we're talking about literally we're talking about an intimate gig to the big uk tour to going out to america does this how much does the set list set list change when you when you do those different shows yeah, I mean, again, I guess you're just, I suppose you're just trying to be fluid and and like open to, there are definitely songs in the US that are connected slightly better there than here and all that kind of stuff. And so I think you're just, you know, we'll normally go with something like skeletal, like a kind of a set, a set list that maybe has like a spine and then, and then, and then we'll, I guess, react to how the crowds are reacting and stuff, I would say. Yeah. Uh, now, just to end the interview on a light note, when we were interviewing bands at Victorious this year, our fun last question was, what was your favourite childhood TV show? Now, seeing as we didn't get to speak to a Victorious, I'll ask you now, what was your favourite childhood TV show? I love Tots TV. Tots TV. <laughs> Just Swiss and Tots. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And I was in an episode as well, actually. No! Yeah, I was, yeah. Well, what, doing what? <laughs> uh, buying sausages from a butcher, yeah. <laughs> How old were you then? About five, I think. About five. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't when met you were like sixteen or something. No, no, hey, tw yeah, twenty-one. No, I met the tots. It was, it was, um, it was, it was a good day. How was that? Was that strange as a five-year-old to see behind the scenes of you know the characters? Yeah, I mean, I can't really remember much about it. I think I was quite sad to to, to finally have it confirmed to me that they weren't real. But you know, 
They are. They are. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, you know, yeah, they are real, but they, they, uh, yeah, they sleep in boxes. <laughs> Justin, it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Um, I, know, l- l- I was going to say good luck, but I know that you don't need good luck because the album oh. is going to be absolutely huge. And I know that both the gigs in Portsmouth and Southampton are going to be huge, as well as the rest of the UK tour and American tour 2024 and everything else that it's going to bring for you guys. Thank you, mate. Thank you.